All right, so my name is Kevin Gu. I am on the faculty at Auburn University in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. I've been at Auburn for about four and a half years, and as Steve said in the introduction, uh, it's been, been about three years now. Um, I did have this sort of eureka moment at 4 a.m., bolted up out of bed with this thought, and uh, ran to the computer, and about two hours later, I had about 70% of what you'll see as far as ideas um, here. So uh, that was concentrated and productive time for me. Um, anyway, what came out of that has been a body of research that I'm pursuing with my colleague Russ Meller at the University of Arkansas. Um, we've been working on this now for a couple few years and we're continuing to push on the theoretical side. I'll show you some of that tonight. Um, we've done a, a good bit beyond what I'm going to show you tonight. I want to stay a little bit focused and just show you sort of the things that led up to the two implementations. And so I'm going to give you a background of maybe 15 or 20 minutes on what the idea is and why it might work or be suitable for your company. Um, and then talk mostly ab about the uh, implementations and that really by way of pictures. I've had the um, privilege of visiting both of these sites and I'll just sort of show you some of the photographs. They're very unprofessional because I took, with, the, with two exceptions, I, I took the photographs myself. So I was at a talk some years ago and someone got up, um, it's the technical seminar, and put up a slide not unlike this and said, um, basically every warehouse looks like this, blah, 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 and he went on and talked about order picking or some such thing, I don't remember exactly. And that that's, um, statement just struck me. Wow, is that right? And I actually asked my colleague, Russ, who was next to me in the audience, uh, I said, is it true? Every warehouse looks like that? And he sort of said, yeah, I think so. And then uh, two months later, I had this sort of uh, thought in the middle of the night. So. Um, and I've, I've given this talk to probably three or 400 people from industry over the last few years. And I always do ask, have you ever seen an exception? Now, obviously, you could have multiple cross aisles and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm talking about something fundamentally different. Has anyone seen something fundamentally different than these designs? Okay, good. So um, the record is still intact. Um, so anyway, we'll... The, the idea behind the research was, why does it have to be straight, was the question I actually woke up with, referring actually to this, this cross aisle here. Now, I want to uh, state my conditions tonight. Number one is I'm talking about unit load warehouses, where I'm going to go into the warehouse, pick a pallet, and bring it back. So I'm not going to do order picking or carton picking, where I would visit multiple locations. That's a very important problem. It's a very interesting problem. Some of you may have that problem. Uh, it's also a very difficult problem, uh, one that I, I don't really have any special insights for you. I, I could talk to you after the seminar and give you what intuition I have on that problem. Uh, by that problem, I mean the design of aisles that would do well for this kind of an operation. So I'm going to talk really about um, unit load warehousing. I go out, get a pallet, stow or pick, and then I come back to a particular single point. That's also going to be critical. Now, we have relaxed these assumptions in other parts of the research, but for now, I'm talking about starting in one place right here, and I'm gonna go out, pick a something, and come back to right there as well. Furthermore, I'm gonna assume that I have randomized storage. And so the probability of going to get something way out in the warehouse is the same as it is going very close to this pickup and deposit point. Um, we have, as I said, we've actually relaxed these assumptions and looked at the effects on, on the designs. It turns out that those assumptions don't really change the best designs, but they change s slightly the expected benefit from implementing these kinds of ideas. All right, so these are what we consider the two unwritten laws of warehouse design as we begin to think about how our warehouses put together and what, what kinds of operating assumptions do we have. Uh, the first one here being that picking aisles are straight and parallel to one another. And the other is, if I do have a cross aisle at all, it's always perpendicular to those picking aisles. And then if I have more than one, of course, they'll be straight and um, parallel to one another as well. So, for example, this, this design would conform to uh, the traditional assumptions. This design does not. Uh, this design happens not to be any good, but I just wanted to relax your thinking for a moment and let you think a little bit freely about uh, why couldn't we do this? Actually, one of my first questions when we, this research came together was uh, on the mechanical side, asking people who build 
the buildings and the racks and all that. Is there any reason you couldn't do something like this? And it turns out there is no uh, mechanical reason, obviously, from a rack manufacturer point of view, uh, to doing something like this. Now, I did get the question about building columns. The very first time I, I uh, talked about this work publicly, um, and it was a real interesting discussion that I'll tell you about off tape. All right, so anyway, uh, we've done a bunch of modeling, and I'm skipping all of that tonight because I want to focus just on the um, results and the implementations, as, as the, uh, the billing said. And so these are uh, two warehouses that are results of our work. So we have a model, basically, that takes number of picking aisles and the depths of those picking aisles, and it asks, okay, you get to insert one cross aisle here in any shape you want. You could make it look like a sine wave, just like the previous one. You can do whatever. What shape do you want? Now, remember the operating assumptions. I begin all travel here. I end all travel here. I go up into the warehouse space, and then I come back. And these are the results of a, this is 21 aisles, 100 pallets deep. This is, um, I think, 41 aisles. We choose odd numbers so that they're, the right and left halves are, are equivalent. And... Uh, 50 pallets deep here. So you note the structure. We call this the flying V, hopefully for obvious reasons. This was early on called the gull wing, but we didn't like the association with trash. So we gave up on that terminology. We now call this the flying V. Um, these are not building columns here in the middle. Those are actually the, the decision variables of our model. It decides where does this cross aisle intersect each picking aisle. And so these are just the results of the model. So the warehouse would look like these without the black dots, obviously. Are there any questions about the, the assumptions and that sort of thing? I don't want to just blow through this and you didn't really understand what in the world I was talking about as far as the problem that I'm trying to address and why these make sense or not. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. That's correct. That, that's correct. Yeah, it turns out, obviously, if you have this kind of operation and you're uh, well, under certain assumptions, you would want to do that, store your faster movers in this area here. If you do that, it turns out that this is still a good design. It's still better than the normal, except the expected benefit is reduced slightly. Uh, now, you do, if you were to collapse this aisle and just make it a traditional design without a cross aisle, um, obviously, you'd consume less space. So there's a trade-off here. You're, you're actually making the warehouse slightly larger because I had to insert the cross aisle, and that's uh, three to five percent, depending on how, how many pallets deep the warehouse is itself. So you are sacrificing a little bit of storage space up front, hopefully to gain the benefit of an operating cost advantage over the long haul. And that's one of the trade-offs that's important to keep in mind. So there are warehouses for which this makes no sense. If you very rarely go in there, pardon me? You mean of uh, the lost space? Well, um, if you've got about a 12-foot aisle here, let's say, then that's roughly three pallets worth. And if it's 100 pallets deep, then that's three out of 100 you lost. I mean, that's just sort of ballpark. Oh, yes. Uh, productivity gains I'm about to get to. Yep. So any, any other questions about this and just what it means? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, where would I do receiving and shipping? I'm accounting for none of those kinds of questions right now. All I'm doing is asking if I were to begin all travel for a worker here and end it all here, where would I, how would I design this? Now, in the applications that I'm going to show you, um, in one case, there was receiving on the top and shipping out the bottom, and so there's actually different configurations um, that you could think about. Um, yes, sir, but it turns out that under our assumption of I'm just going out for one thing and coming back, you would never use that, I mean, in theory land. 